Thank you for returning to lecture two uh, in the lecture series of 11 weeks on uh, church architecture, theology, and history. Um, today, I would like to build last week's um, lecture on what space is and look at particularly as space becomes church. Um, just a very brief review from last week. There we go. Um, if you recall, if you were if you joined us last week, um, I raised certain questions around uh, space and differentiated between space and place. We looked at the architecture and the relationship between space and architecture. Um, and the various aspects, which included on uh, looking at space as absolute versus relative space, the multidimensionality of space, um, questions of how space is intertwined with time, which Dr. Irvin will pick up more particularly today, the role of perception in how we experience space, and even the idea of how our bodies take up a certain amount of space both inside and around us. One question I did raise and I would like to focus on is uh, how important space is uh, for our psychological and spiritual expression, our experience of ourselves, God, and others. So this, I will revisit these questions today as we look at the uh, church as space. If space is socially and bodily constituted, as we looked at it last week, and if space is not just an empty void or container, and space is multidimensional and metaphorically provides a means of imagining and giving expression to the possibilities of the various expressions, both culturally and socially uh, encompassing different um, ideas. What does it look like when we actually now go into the idea of religious space or the place where religious practices take place? and how that also inherently is social and what does that look like in its expression? So today, some questions I'd like to ask is as a way of orienting our discussion is what is church? What is the relationship between church and institution? And I have some sub questions about the body of believers and the actual church structure. Uh, what would space look like uh, for communion with God and his people? Um, the idea of deconstruction and conversion of church spaces, I thought it would be interesting to look at what church spaces were before they became churches and what has happened in the history of some of those spaces changing. So perhaps looking at a few examples of that. And I like to close the lecture by looking at two particular uh, imageries of what space uh, as church is in Mateos Julietzi's homilies. And he was a 14th, 15th century Armenian uh, Vartapet, who I will say a bit more as we get to the to that part of the lecture. Um, because I find interactive learning to be a lot more interesting, why don't I start with saying what is church and open to you in terms of the idea of what is the first words or images or ideas that come into your mind when I say church or when you hear church? Maybe we'll start with our seminarians briefly. And then if you have anything to add, uh, I'd like to spend about a minute doing uh, this sort of more interactive expression of how we understand church. Anything? Well, yes, um, Zare. First thing that comes to mind is singing. Singing. Okay. Very nice. Singing. An altar. Altar. A group of people gathered. Group of people gathered. Anyone else? Anyone from our Zoom room? What is church? A place to pray. Community of believers. Community of believers. Um, so the word uh, is inherited in the English church from the Germanic word. Um, and it's probably, this is uh, debatable, but coming from the Greek. In the various ways of defining the actual word, it comes down to this idea of building for public worship or the worship performed there or therein. Um, so that's one way of looking at it. In the Armenian, um, church 
is derived from the Greek word ecclesia and the Latin word congratio. Um, and in the Armenian, as we see it here, I have it on the second point, it really defines in multiple ways, but here's just four I've listed. It's people, assembly of the faithful, as we said, uh, building, temple, chapel, or consecrated a space uh, to God, an assembly of any people. So perhaps, again, again, this idea of community. So again, not to get into much into the linguistic on folding of it, but I thought it would be helpful to uh, look at some of the ways uh, we can identify what church is, the idea of people gathering, the community of people coming together. Um, church, uh, some of the questions that I also think about as church becomes, our space becomes church, is um, some of the functions of form and uh, function, and some of the ideas of form and function. How does the architecture of the aesthetics and the functionality of it come together, as I will unfold in a few more slides? Um, the role of memory also, as it also unfolds in time and space, it becomes very interesting to think about as um, when we think of a space uh, not being consecrated as a place we call church, a place of gathering. So a few slides from last week, just to uh, refresh our memories about how we've looked at some spaces being um, reframed and uh, also purposed for church. We have traditional Orthodox expression on the left and some, a, a church in California. Um, we looked at these other expressions um, of church as modern cave-like church space and also a more theater-like uh, place expression uh, of gathering and then bringing people together in I, uh, places um, more so in um, sort of like that theater and uh, construct of what church is and what gatherings take place. In terms of what what about the de deconstruction and conversion of church spaces, last week I looked at this, the, the Parthian, which was a, uh, a pagan uh, structure that had become a, now a Catholic church. I'd like to take that just a bit further and look at, for example, the Armenian church, Ed Shmiadzin, um, a place where the word of God dwells or where, where Christ descended. Uh, was also a construction on a formerly uh, pagan temple. So again, this idea of deconstruction and conversion of, church, of space to make it to be more um, for the purposes of Christian worship or Christian um, uh, gathering place. Um, this also makes me think when I think of deconstruction or conversion, I, I presented another image of uh, the theater. What about what, what do we think of when we look at church as um, a place like this one and what we see in our screens? Uh, a theater like place that has been turned into a church. Or sometimes we also see a church that has been turned into a theater. This also ha happens. So, this idea of the oscillation between how space is used. Uh, to bring about um, this idea of um, church, a place of gathering. Um, this, ever since now the last few years with the pandemic, the new space that has been created for church is the internet church. Or sometimes uh, in my research of reading about this, it was interesting to find how there's actually even a... Um, discussion about online church and church online being two very different ways of expressing church communities. Um, so for example, you could join a church service online, which is live, or you can actually create a very different experience by just having the internet church. Um, so that I thought that was interesting to see what it means when your home becomes a space that you turn into a place of gathering with people who may not, you, you may not necessarily have direct contact with, but you do via stream. And this takes me to another place also when I think about the construction and conversion of church spaces, 
Uh, some of you may know about the story of Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, Turkey. Um, it has a very interesting story where it was a temple in the third, fourth century turned into a church, which then in, in at the quest, at the conquest during the, um, I believe it was in the 13, 14 centuries when the Ottomans took over Constantinople, Saga Sophia became a mosque. And then the church and mosque turned into a museum in 1920s under, under Atatürk. Um, and then that very museum turned into a mosque just as of 2020. So this idea of what this means, where we see not only between deconstruction and conversion between pagan to Christian churches, but now we see from Christian churches into mosques, and then back into this idea of the spectacle being a museum, and then back again. What does that say to us about the space becoming church? One of, and this could really be a lecture of its own. I just want to introduce it here and perhaps even raise questions about what we think of space to be. Um, and I personally uh, stood in the inside the Hagia Sophia a while ago while it was a museum, uh, and it was quite interesting to experience. Not necessarily uh, if later on, as I look at church being a place of worship and the presence of God, not necessarily experiencing that, but perhaps the experience of what had happened there in history over its course. So just that, because that you could see both the uh, what is hidden behind the walls in the church of Hagia Sophia uh, in its uh, frescoes and mosaics and whatnot, but also on top of that, seeing some of the uh, Arabic a script and writings around it, which you could also see on the left screen here. Now, moving just a bit more east from Hagia Sophia into the Lake Vaughan area, another place uh, that I'd like to bring to your to our discussion about a church turned into a museum and what it actually means in the course of its history is the church of uh, in Ahtamad, the Holy Cross Church on the island of Ahtamar. And this has a very significant meaning, both in Armenian Christian history and architecture. And throughout the course, especially, I believe it's in week eight, I will explore a lot more about Ahtamar. Uh, but for now, I'm just uh, wanting to bring this conversation into more about how this turns into another place for spectacle, like a museum. So here's a picture of Ahtamar. Inside Ahtama, I believe this is from 2015, uh, where lots of tourists are taking a picture of the inside of the church. You can see the frescoes, but no longer is it really the place of worship or the presence of God, so to speak. And even though we do have the altar there, I believe this was right immediately after uh, the liturgy, which now once a year, uh, the, Armenian, the Armenian Patriarchate is able to uh, hold a full liturgy at Ahtamar. So this idea that this historic church that, that was built in 1113 um, has reinstated its role, a place for worship once again, once a year. But again, the rest of the time you experience it as another space for museum. So going back to what is church as a building for public worship or where a place where worship is performed, um, I'd like to look at um, following, again, early church fathers. Athanasius is uh, uh, very important in this commentaries, but also in quite a bit coming from the Armenian church fathers, too. But I decided to focus on these three points uh, of a church as a place for worship. Is a, is a in worship? It's a place where beliefs are expressed. Um, and if we look at church as a place for worship, it's a, a beliefs. These beliefs where it is expressed, it's also where uh, these beliefs inform how we worship. And uh, and also baptism becomes uh, one of the sacraments of uh, many where the sacramental life of the church becomes active and enacted um, 
within the construct and the walls of that church. Um, looking at Matthew Svat Vartapejohayetzi's comments on what church is, um, I like to just reflect briefly on um, so he, he offers a commentary on the on the Psalms uh, expressing the house of God as a place for worship. But what uh, what I think is interesting from his from his list, which actually is about 15 different expressions of um, uh, uh, of what worship and uh, presence of God is like throughout the scriptures. Um, I'd like to just point a few for uh, for us to think about as church as the place where the presence of God dwells. Um, in his commentary, he expresses um, he begins with the Garden of Eden, actually. So just going back to this place of uh, church, at, you know, the garden, this is where the presence of God is expressed, experienced first. Um, this enclosed place, as it's described in the 16th, 17th century map. Um, it's interesting to see the how space is envisioned as a place where God's presence dwells. Another area where Mateus ex, uh, ex, uh, explores is the Noah's Ark. And this is actually uh, not just only coming from Mateus in most of orthodoxy and um, and ch church uh, fathers who write about the church as the nave or the place of where they enter into the presence of God and under the protection of God. Uh, Noah's Ark becomes very uh, much of an image um, in many of these uh, commentaries to explain about what it means to be um, um, at the presence and at the uh, place of worship. So, uh, and I, Dr. Urban explains and uh, will go into the idea of the, that difference. I'm not sure if it's the we'll look at it next week. week. Next week. We'll be adding a number of uh, these images to see yes. specifically what their, what their purpose is. That's right. And referring to church. So I'll refrain from making too much comments about the purpose of the of the boat and the ark and all all that, but I think it's a very it's a phenomenal expression and tune in for next week to learn more about that. Um, so another place we see um, presence of God as a uh, and also a place of uh, where there is the encounter of the divine which Matthias also expands as what it is to have it, uh, have the place to be the house of God is in Moses's altar. And again, an enclosed place, an enclosed space where the divine meets with, the, there's that exchange of meeting with the divine. So the gathering of people um, coming together uh, for again a place to worship, we see this also in Solomon's temple. Uh, that's another one uh, that Matthias reflects on. And quite interestingly, going back to Noah's Ark, um, I'd like to sort of bring one imagery kind of comparison to this. Um, and perhaps it's just my own reading of interpretation of it, but to see the Armenian church and how the constructs sometimes may um, embody that expression of the art. So if you imagine um, the ark, but also this church structure being where uh, there's that resemblance of entering in the protection and presence of God. Uh, this is um, Baltev, I believe. Uh, this is the... I believe it's that. It's, it's no, Ripsima. It's Ripsima. Yeah. A few more expressions of that. Um, this is again Ripsima. And then I thought bringing a familiar image of uh, our church in Burbank, just seeing a little bit of that expression um, and how that actually may think about what it means to be.
uh, entering the presence and under the protection of God. I think what speaks the most in many of the biblical uh, imagery and also expressions, whether it comes from uh, the epistles by Apostle Paul, is this idea that it's the, the body, the body of Christ, the idea that the expression comes through um, where we meet uh, together, uh, we actually, each of us, form as the body of Christ. Um, so really at the end, if Ecclesia or the gathering of the people, and if the church comes together as a place where we meet the divine, um, I thought it's interesting reflecting back to what I presented as space uh, being uh, the human body, which is a source of space, dimension of space, an aspect of space, and the dynamics of space, how that we each other coming together are bringing spaces, enclosing spaces, and um, experiencing uh, what it means to be in God's presence. But more so, the same imagery of the body is also what the apostles use to speak about uh, the church that is the body of Christ. Um, I'm not going to get into the various theological points in that, that is, you know, expounding on the epistles and also the various places where Paul speaks about how each one of us serve uh, as, as being part of the body and the idea of the structure of uh, the church, as he explains it in Timothy also, is very interesting. But as a, in the unfolding of the course, um, as we talk about the various architectural designs of the churches, various uh, enactments of how the ch churches came, the churches were built or came together. Some of these things will be commented on throughout. But for the time being, I just want to bring it to your to the to the forefront of our minds about the body, the human body being uh, an analogy which we have seen um, throughout Scripture about where space becomes church, so to speak, and we are the church, We are, and, and in, in the sense of the indwelling of the spirit, that is also, again, as Dr. Irvin will continue in the next part of the lecture, to see where the indwelling of the spirit takes place, ultimately, in our, in ours, in, in, in the human person, that is. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to um, close this part of my lecture, and um, leave question and answers for the end, and then have Dr. Irvin pick up the Armenian tradition and also the second part of the lecture. As Dr. Shahinian just shared with us, space and church are not exactly the same thing. It's a, it's a church, we could look at it as a specially purposed space, perhaps, um, maybe even a kind of a container for the uncontainable, a place of meeting for people with one another, for people with God many different ways to look at this. There's one thing more that I think we need to add before we jump into looking at some of the spaces themselves and looking at the many ways that Armenian Vodka Bedutun chose to build them, many different types of expression that are to be found in the world of Armenian church architecture. So the thing that we need to add is again, something that's intangible, but that affects us all. Nowadays, scientists tell us that space is not a thing by itself. It's not even an emptiness by itself. Space is actually, they say, intertwined with time. Mm -hmm. Time and space, they say, are interdependent. Time and space, they say, are woven into one another. They're coexistent with one another. If you are one of those who appreciates technical theological vocabulary, we might even say that space is coessential with time. Science tells us that one way of looking at this 
it's not even an overlapping, this coexistence of space and time is to think of it as forming together a kind of a net. Not a perfect image, but it's helpful, I think. And so they say, when human beings create something like a church, obviously they create it within space, but they also create it within time. And the scientists say, what we create, what we put into the net that space and time form, actually affects space and time. It actually bends space and time just by being within them. <laughs> space and time aren't really the only thing that are bent here. It's also my mind when I stop and think about this and uh, I'm so glad I don't have to be 100% fully conscious of the way that I'm bending time and space at any given moment in my life. But it's also interesting to, to think about it. What does that mean? That what we create and what we put into space and how we move through space might actually have an effect on both our space and our time. So another slightly less mind-bending way to look at this, different metaphor for it. Again, a limited illustration, but I think it's useful. Could be this. If we were to imagine time and space, space-time, time-space, whatever we want to call this combined thing, it usually flows peacefully through the landscape as long as nothing gets in its way, as long as nothing intrudes into it. But even a very small object like a rock will cause the flow of the river to change. The river will actually accommodate itself to the contours of the object in its quest to continue the flow. Ripples begin to appear in what was the fully placid surface of the water. And as the objects increase in size or number or both, the flow of the water becomes more and more irregular. From our point of view, maybe more and more interesting. As it swirls, moves, is pushed from one object to another object, And ultimately, if the objects are big enough, and if they're set in a certain way, molecules of water that were on opposite sides of the river originally may find themselves thrown together and interacting in ways that could not have been predicted from the beginning. So that's a second way to look at it, but it's still rather theoretical. The idea of time and space interacting in and around the object of a church building. But how do they do it? After all, time and space, although we live in them, are both invisible to us. In the final analysis, we sense them 
but we do not see them. Armenian vertebrates had no greater vision physically than we do, and time and space were still invisible to them as well. But even though they would not have maybe used the kind of vocabulary that we use today to talk about space-time, they had a very interesting intuitive understanding of how time worked. And that understanding affected the kind of structures that they built in space-time. And I want to share something about this view of time with you, because it's not our usual everyday kind of Western understanding of time. So let me take a few minutes to explain it. It's counterintuitive to us as we have been raised to experience life. We all take it for granted that time is unidirectional, doesn't turn around, which can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on what you happen to be doing at the time. And it's pretty much linear, rather like a road that goes from point A to point B. That's why we build them. And we expect a road to do this for us. It carries us from one place to the next place. Time does this for us as well in our experience of it. And even if the road may wind around a bit, even if it winds around quite a lot, it's still going from point A to point B. There's a starting point and there's a destination. We may get to that destination quickly. Or it may take longer. But there is still a point A from which we begin, and a point B, somewhere off the right edge of the screen to which we hope to arrive. And even if we're very open-minded and we think of our road as being perhaps ordinary like this one, there's still a point A and a point B. Perhaps our experience of time in our life is a little bit more scary. There's still a point A and a point B. Our particular trajectory in time may be on the adventurous side. There's still a point A. And a point B, we expect to reach something in time. Our experience of time may be just a little bit strange or unearthly. It still has a point A and a point B. You get on the walkway, you fully expect to get to the end of the walkway. Even roads in time that are not for everyone still have that expectation. You're going to start somewhere and end somewhere. And whenever we get there, wherever there happens to be, we can't go back in time. Today is today. Tomorrow is tomorrow and never the twain shall meet. You didn't get it done today? Oh, well. <laughs> Add it to your list for tomorrow, and if you don't get it done tomorrow, you 
cannot come back to today and shove it in there somewhere and expect it to work. This is how we generally experience time. We have been conditioned to experience it in this way, but not all cultures do. Other cultures both experience and view time quite differently from us. And just to give one example, for many people, time is circular. There is no beginning point to it necessarily. Perhaps there was, but not necessarily. And there does not have to be an ending point to it either. What goes around definitely comes around again and again. And in fact, in this view, we go around and come around again and again and again until we accomplish, achieve, or learn whatever it is that we need to achieve, accomplish, or learn from our embodied existence. And then we are released from the circularity of time into something else. Armenian understanding of time actually is neither one of these. It combines the two of them. So the Armenian view of time is something like this. Like a spiral staircase, time does have directionality. It does have motion from a starting point to an ending point somewhere, but the motion that we make to get from, B, from point A to point B is not linear. This semicircular passage of time, circular linear passage of time, may be ethereally beautiful or it may be kind of old and tired as we experience it, a little run down. It may even make us slightly dizzy. And to use one of Dr. Shahinyan's illustrations from last week, the spiral may not be perfectly symmetrical when an architect plops it down in the middle of Manhattan. But the general effect is still the same, whether the, whether the spiral goes in or out, however that works, the effect is the same. And whether we are going up or going down a spiral staircase, there are two things that we notice, two essential things to our understanding of time. First, we notice that there is an empty point around which this spiral revolves. It has, if you like, an axis something unmoving and unchanging around which it, time, moves and changes. The second thing that Armenians noticed about this spiral development of time is that as we move higher and higher, or lower and lower as the case may be, it depends which direction you're going. We view that central point from a different level. We view the same thing over and over 
and over again, but we do so from a different vantage point. And it's not just that central point. We pass again and again over points that we have already traversed on the staircase. And our view of each one of those points changes. So here you see people walking on this staircase. The ones on the left of the slide are stand are walking more or less above two people who are on the ground. The people who are walking up the staircase came from below. They have seen that object in the middle close up. Now, as they go higher, they view it from the top. They get a different angle on it completely, whereas the two who are at the bottom still don't have that perspective. They are face to face with that object. And to them, it looms very large, whereas to those above, it becomes smaller and smaller the higher they go. Likewise, the people who are on the right on the staircase are standing more or less above two others on the ground. Those who are above may remember what they saw from below, but those who are still below can as yet have no idea of what awaits them above. And in fact, the people below may be completely unaware that somewhere higher up, sometime in future time, they will be looking at the same circumstance from an entirely different point of view. As far as those at the bottom of the spiral are concerned, they are having a conversation which looks rather threatening, perhaps. The person above can see exactly how the body language is playing out, can see the things that those below actually are unaware of in themselves. Now, if, the, if time functions like this, and Armenians were quite sure that it did, then this has huge implications for how we build structures and what we expect from those structures, what we expect to take place in this space, which has been described as the meeting place of the divine and the human, the meeting place of people with each other. If the Vartabeds who planned Armenian churches in the Middle Ages were alive today, I believe that they might depict that interexistent spiraling movement of time and space like this. We're all familiar with this, right? From science classes in school. What is it? A string of DNA. Yeah, it's a string of DNA. It's the, it tells us that if space and time together function this way as well, then we are looking at not just a structure made by humans, but also at a structure that is built into existence itself, the helix of all of life is going to be reflected in the structure of Armenian church buildings. This kind of spiral formation 
makes it possible for a number of things to happen, not just for life to happen, not just for us by putting something into this to create new structures. It also makes it possible for both DNA and staircases to pack much, much more directed movement into a single slice or tube of space. If you were to stretch out that staircase and make it straight, like the staircase in the buildings that we live in here on campus, the number of stairs there would, would require much longer area to achieve the same ascent. Whereas by compacting this, you're able to fit that entire expanse into something relatively small and contained. This is going to be very important when it comes to Armenian church structures. As we will see, by and large, Armenian churches over time have tended to be small. There's a reason for that. And it's not simply, well, there weren't that many people. Not at all. It's this compacting possibility, this possibility of including different layers of time inside a single container that will give Armenian churches their density and their, I don't know, a quality of being at home in life. Okay, so we have to add into our consideration of Varta Veduchun and space, the making of churches. We have to add this spiral compacting of time into our view of church architecture. And next week we will be coming back to look at some of the images that Dr. Shahinyan shared with us. We're going to add some more and we're going to see how that expresses itself in layers of time within the same space. It's going to be a very, very important, in fact, it's going to be a cardinal factor in how Armenian church space is constructed. But this kind of thing doesn't happen overnight. I'm sure nobody woke up in the fourth century suddenly with a vision that said, this is how we're going to construct churches and we're going to include everything in them, past, present, future, and it's all going to look like this. No. <laughs> Human understanding evolves. It opens gradually over time. As people experience again and again the same type of space, it's going to change. First, before Armenian Christians could begin the process of developing Varta Vedutyun and growing a sophisticated vocabulary of architectural structures, ramp up their thinking about space and time, Christianity had to become legal for any of that to start. Ah, I just like this, this is one of those double helixes in space. And once Christianity did become legal, certain very, very basic elements of Armenian church architecture came to the fore. It's as though Armenian Batabeds and Armenian architects are standing at the bottom of that spiral staircase. And that thing that is at the bottom of the staircase, which they're going to view differently from different levels, never goes away. They will do different things with it, but it will always be the same object. 
it will always be that space around which everything else revolves. So we're going to be looking at how Armenians came to first incorporate an element of church that is never going to go away, but that will change, develop, evolve, elaborate itself over time. Okay, most people know that, that Armenia became a Christian country, a Christian state, sometime between 301 and 314, depending on how you interpret the evidence. Which meant that finally, Christians in Armenia as elsewhere could begin emerging from the shadows where they had been sometimes actually hiding, but certainly staying out of the mainstream awareness. It didn't pay to stand out, to be distinctive. And so early Christians hadn't really needed church architecture until it became a public thing. Worship became a public experience. Early Christians met in sizable homes, like this one. The remnants of this structure were discovered in the early aughts. During a building project, <laughs> Israel is one of those places where you can't dig without finding something. So there was this building project at the Megiddo prison in Northern Israel. And as they were digging for something else, obviously it turned into an archeological exploration, which revealed the entire neighborhood in which the house was located. When it was first built, this settlement together with the, the house church stood just across the way from a Roman military camp. So presumably the people who lived in this neighborhood were either military families or local people who were catering to the needs of the military who were stationed there. Meaning that among those people are Christians. The inmates from the present day prison who were helping out in this excavation made some fantastic discoveries. They found these really well-preserved mosaic floors. And it was in fact these floors that identified the house as a church. For one thing, their motifs. Could be viewed as Christian with the fish. Also the number of squares and other things. And one of the Greek inscriptions told the excavators that this pedestal sitting in the middle of the mosaics was actually the base of an altar, elevating this otherwise nondescript ordinary looking building into a functional worship space. <laughs> 
Again, from the outside, you wouldn't know. From the inside, it became clear. Modifications were made that allowed this ordinary space to become a space of worship, a space for the meeting between people, a space for the meeting between the divine and the human. Another one of these ancient house church structures had been discovered earlier in a place called Dura Oiropos, a city that was on the border between Roman and Parthian territories in the eastern desert region of Syria. And when archaeologists began to excavate this site and dig there, they had the advantage of knowing that whatever they found in this place was going to date from sometime between the year 113 when the city was founded and the year 256 when it was destroyed. So whatever is there is going to be within that little time frame. It's And the house church that was discovered there was more elaborate than the one at Megiddo, had several rooms, it had more than one floor. It was very substantially built. And then the, the house structure was kind of retrofitted to make it more suitable for group worship. So a full baptistry was added to it. And you can see on the walls the remnants of biblical scenes in fresco that presumably would be suitable to the site of a baptism. And so when we look at them close up, even though not that much remains, you can still kind of see what this depiction was of. You see a woman bearing a torch and some kind of a container. There's two women, and actually you could see the feet of three others. They're not visible in this picture. So people have interpreted it in different ways. They've said, well, this is the myrrh-bearing women coming to the tomb of Christ. Others have said, mm, maybe not. This is, the, this is the wise and foolish virgins. And then above this panel of the whatever they are, the virgins or the myrrh-bearing women, was a smaller series of panels of different scenes from the miracles and life of Christ. So on the left, you see Jesus healing the paralytic man. He's lying on his bed. And then in the background, the man has taken up his bed and he's walking. The other panel shows a boat with a number of figures in the back looking towards two people walking on the water. And so presumably these scenes were considered to have exegetical connections with baptism or initiation into the Christian faith. So these are two samples of early, early Christian worship spaces. This changes significantly when in the fourth century, Christians were able to emerge from such private spaces into the light of legal day. Three centuries after Christ, and so as they stepped into the light of normal society, 
They had the advantage and the disadvantage. It's one of those swords that cuts both ways of emerging as part of an imperially sanctioned cult. So it's quite natural that the imperial government, which was starting to openly patronize this once persecuted faith, would provide the paradigm for the new public Christian worship spaces, putting the stamp of, our, of imperial approval on their activities by housing those activities in spaces that would be familiar to people looking at them as legitimate, recognized public space. And so quite naturally then, the new worship spaces of legalized Christianity are modeled on the buildings of the state. A Roman administrative public buildings were basilicas, buildings of the basileus, buildings of the ruler. And there was probably something really gratifying for Christians in getting to use such spaces. Spaces that were shaped like the one you see in the floor plan here. Not only was the approval of the government a really good thing to have, but what could possibly be better than to use spaces symbolic of the presence of the earthly ruler in order to worship the heavenly king? A basilica is like the one we see here, served several government functions, as well as housing events, maybe in their open spaces. Basilicas were where the representative of the emperor or the emperor himself came to conduct business and to dispense justice. There was an apse a bump out <laughs> at either end of the building. In one of them, the statue of the emperor stood. In the other, at the other end of the building, there was a raised bema on which the seat of the imperial representative was placed when he came to hear judicial cases that would be brought before him. There was a direct line of sight from one end of the basilica to the other, a single horizontal axis that connected the emperor's statue presence with the live presence of his representative. Everything in the basilica focused on the bema. And that central rectangular space, as you can see, was divided into three kind of lanes. You have a wider one in the middle, two narrower ones on the sides. It was divided by two sets of columns that created a central space and two side aisles. And in those side aisles, there would be perhaps movable booths for lesser government functionaries. So when, when the court is going to be in session, there will be uh, secretaries, notaries, and other things set up along the side. And the imperial representative at the end would be able to uh, either assign people or they would come already having done whatever legal business they needed to do in those little areas around the edge. And as you can imagine, the space is often crowded. So in order to kind of divide things up, 
When the court was in session and the imperial representative was seated on the bema at the top of the stairs, this one doesn't show you a, a solid bema, but get the idea. Attorneys, secretaries, and people directly involved in pleading the proceedings or in recording the proceedings stood in a restricted area in front of the Bema. So no one could crowd them, they could be heard. While the audience of people who had a stake in the case to whom the outcome of the case mattered, were gathered behind in the larger space. And it's this iconography, this spatial setup, that became essential to the Armenian church's structure, permanently essential to it. Although there are, as we'll see, some differences, and we'll come back to this momentarily. Here's a sample of a Roman government, Byzantine government building. This is the Basilica of Maxentius and Constantine. And you can see that as befit its role, its importance as the place where one would encounter the presence of the emperor, the size and the interior decor of this basilica convey an opulence that is meant to impress the person who is coming into this space with the power, greatness, dignity, and importance of the emperor that it represented. In imperial centers, as the basilical structure was adapted for Christian worship use, many variants of it emerged. The basic structure will remain the same. You can see an elevation of a basilica. It has, can have one floor, it can have two, it can have three, kind of stacked on top of one another. The basic three-part structure, two side aisles and a middle space is the same. One of the most famous basilicas for Christian use is the one in Bethlehem, also of great importance to Armenians. It's a structure where the position of the Bema is actually directly above the nativity cave. It's a statement. It was built by an earthly emperor and his mother, Constantine and Helena, for the heavenly king and his mother. So although the plan is very simple, and the present condition of the church makes it a little bit harder to see it. The flooring in this cathedral, or this basilica, which you can, you see that there are openings in the floor where you can still see the ancient mosaics, so they're still in excellent condition because nobody's walked on them. They're all in earth tones. The earthly realm is represented in these extraordinarily high quality mosaics. The empire of the earth is not without its resources and it certainly has its beauty. While the mosaics above are crystal and gold filled with the divine light glinting off them as they tell the stories of the heaven reality, heavenly reality that unfolded from its humble beginnings 
with Christ's human birth. So this is a very expressive form of architecture. Here's another example. The church of Santa Sabina in Rome was built in 432. From the outside, it looks very plain. It even looks austere. It doesn't look warm and friendly in any way. And when you walk inside, the sheer scale of its internal space is absolutely breathtaking. You can see the Bama, the courtroom end of the basilica, is set off from the rest of the space by an imposingly solid toss that makes a definite barrier, a definite distinction between the people who are performing the liturgy and the people who are not, between the people who are actively involved in the court case and the people who are listening to the outcome. And even though the very massive walls of this basilica seem to soar into the air, just ethereally above the floor, this is a space that was not intended to put humans at ease. It's a space that is not on a human scale. It's a space that reinforces the kind of divine imperial presence within it. And you can see how dwarfed the people are in scale who come here to worship. The same idea, this basilical church, developed just a little bit differently on the fringes of the empire. There's a small Druze village on the Turkish border in Northwest Syria called Kalbloz. It was best known for the massacre of its inhabitants in 2015 mm -hmm. by an Islamic militant group. However, beyond that, it's home to this. A basilica built sometime in the early 460s. So we look at this and we can see that there are some differences from what we saw in the earlier structures. What has happened to the basilical form here? Instead of having freestanding columns that are supporting that second story above called a clear story, like there were at Bethlehem, there are arches holding it up. And there's this major structure in the middle where the readings would be declaimed and where preaching might take place. So the focus in this structure is on the word. And as you see this from the air, it becomes obvious that if you were to enter the door, which is on the left of your screen, from the front courtyard, you would slip into the side aisle in order to enter the main part of this structure. So you don't come into it as you would into a Byzantine or Roman basilica through the center, you come into it through the side. And there are also supports that you can see, notches that you can see along the top of the clear story for beams of a wooden ceiling to rest, again, lightening that load on the side walls. In this church, the apse is really heavily adorned and its windows make a Trinitarian statement. You have three windows, equal size, at equal height, 
and the altar area can be seen mirrored in the shape of the doorway, which is also open from above. So this is in the, a basilica in the south, in the northern fringe of the empire. We also find basilicas. This recently uncovered basilica in the far eastern end of Georgia is one of a whole network of basilicas and other Christian structures, including a Zoroastrian fire temple. It's not just the Armenians who build churches on those. Mm -hmm. And while this is large, and clearly a basilica, you can see the central space of the two side aisles, the leading down to the main altar, it's not on the scale of the basilicas that are nearer to the heart of the empire. And from the air, you can see that it's constructed with what's called litsk between two um, thin layers of dressed stone, something that's characteristic of Armenian architecture as well. It helps to preserve against earthquakes. Obviously, in this case, it didn't work entirely. Here's a reconstruction of it that shows it with clear story arches like they had at Kalb Lowe's, but without the ambo in the middle for declaiming the word. And you can see the steps of the Bema, the steps to the judge's podium. Are in the center. And then there are raised seats around the apse. Okay, so we're going to take another very short break before we come back to see what the Armenians did compared to what their neighbors were doing, the neighbors north and south with these basilical structures. And hopefully we'll have time to look at four, but we'll see. So take five minutes. As you can see, it's more modest in its dimensions and it stands amid a landscape that was made famous in Armenian church history by the mission of Gregory the Illuminator's grandson Grigoris to the tribes of Armenia's wild east, a mission during which he was martyred. The site again became famous as a school of Mesrop Mashtots, the inventor of the Armenian alphabet, who taught here and installed teachers here to spread learning throughout the same region. The political situation around Amaras was often unstable. And so Amaras is surrounded by later fortifications whose walls served also um, to house monastic structures. The church was built above the tomb of St. Grigoris. As you can see, it's a very simple space, has its own external entrance. And the inside of the church is exceedingly simple. It has a single axis, it is a basilical structure. How does it compare to the basilicas that we looked at previously? It's much more on a human scale. No one is going to disappear in this church. Then if we go deeper into Armenia, almost into the center of the country, we find this basilica in Aparan. Again, this is not on a, on a scale that's going to dwarf anyone coming into it. 
It has doors into its side aisles, as you can see on the long side of the church. There's no clear story, no second floor in this church. It's super spare, bare bones basilica. Just three windows in the side. And as you can see, the central space in this basilica is very narrow. And apparently, it didn't fully meet the needs of its community because going forward, new structures were added to the sides of it. You can see a second chapel. So two basilicas, but on a much smaller scale. Contrasted with that, not far from Yerevan is Devine, or what was once Devine. The capital city of Armenia from 335 and the center of the church as well shortly thereafter. So Etchmiadzin was not the administrative hub of the church. And that was true for a number of centuries. Devine's cathedral was built in its own enclave, you can see uh, this reconstruction of the city of Devin with the central citadel, the larger government area, and then a bridge connecting the secular power to the center of administrative center of the Katoigo state, all of it within the larger walled city. Excavations at this luxurious site, in addition to uncovering structures from different time periods, revealed the outline, you can see it here, of a large basilica, 100 feet by 90 feet, over half the length of a football field that would have been sitting on a stepped foundation. And you can still see the steps, the style of eight steps that kept it above ground level. It's been reconstructed to look like this. So you can see compared to the others that we have looked at, this is a pretty sumptuous structure. Unlike the more private settings of Amaras and Aparan, the Catholic state was clearly interested in impressing the faithful and visitors coming from the outside. Not only making it clear that there is a new religion in town by taking over the former temple that had stood on this site, but by making sure that the new religions headquarters was on a royal scale. And some of the decorative elements from this cathedral have remained. And as you can see, the capitals of pillars and such are pretty massive and quite beautiful. Each and every one of these basilica churches, large or small, within Armenia, and some of those outside, maintained the royal courtroom structure of their originals. And even today, the main body of the church for an Armenian church is not called the nave, although ship imagery does get applied to the church, but it's not, it's not the technical term for the inside of the church. The inside of the church is called an adyan. In other words, a courtroom. It's called a place 
of hearing. It's a place where you could go to be heard. It's a place for the adjudication of grievances and for setting things right. The bema of the Roman courtroom still stands, but it stands now within another image that Dr. Shahinyan mentioned. It stands within a choran, in other words, a tent, which is how the apse itself is referred to. The same word that's used for the tent of Abraham and his hospitality to the three figures, divine figures that came to him. It's the same word that's used for the tent of the tabernacle, the movable presence of God constructed by Moses that accompanied the people throughout the wilderness. So although the Choran in which the courtroom scene is set in an Armenian church is not movable. There's still the recollection of the time when it was. So in an Armenian church, in the Choran on the Bema, the priest, as the lawyer for the defense, presents the case for humanity against the accusations that are brought against us by our adversary. With deacons making announcements, pronouncements, giving instructions from the Bema to the functionaries below in the toss, whether it's other clergy, the choir, who in turn lead the assembled people who have a stake, a serious stake in the outcome of this case, to express themselves well from the space that is reserved for them. so that they have an intimate ringside seat on the progress of this case. And the outcome of the case is always the same. Thanks to the mediatorship of Christ and the advocacy of his mother, who is always visible above an Armenian altar, The enemy who from time immemorial has sought to keep humanity enslaved to all things that are harmful, death producing, and life denying is forced to relinquish us entirely. The Judge allows him to retain no claim upon us. And the verdict is that we must be reinstated in our freedom as children of God. Then and now, and to the ages of future ages. It's a somewhat different way of viewing church from what we perhaps have been used to. And I think that as we begin to unpack how within this space, layer upon layer of time and perspective appear together 
we are going to discover in a lot of detail what Dr. Shahinian was just speaking about. Space becomes church in a way that unites both space and time, activity on earth, activity in the heavenly sphere. I think it's going to be a very interesting next few weeks.